Greetings and welcome back to room 303, AP English, the World of Ideas Lecture. We are in Unit 6 Culture. This is lecture number 34, Ruth Benedict's The Pueblos of New Mexico from her classic Patterns of Culture in 1934. Now our assumptions, like always, are that you've been paying attention to our stuff at LearnStrong.net, especially lectures 1 through 33, especially the previous two lectures in Unit number 6 on Herodotus and Devaka. We'll be referencing it in uh, those, those topics to some degree. We also assume your understanding of our learning theory, our annotative theory to answer questions at level one, what does the text say? Summary of out, a paragraph outlining. At level two, what does the text mean? Uh, themes, messages, and our big five of, of uh, epistemology, ontology, psychology, sociology, and theodicy. And then the 2B question of rhetoric, not what that it says, but how she says it in the rhetorical concepts so that we can become a better writer. That's the whole idea of our reading here. And then finally at level three, how can I relate to this information at 3A and other texts? And finally at 3B ourselves. And then finally the assumption is you're trying to read this material on your own. I really want to challenge you guys to do that. Read the material on your own and then come uh, for some help here. Let's do some brief bio and background information real quickly. Dates for Benedict, 1887 to 1948. She studied anthropology at Columbia under Frank Boas. She gets her PhD from Columbia in 23, 1923. She is renowned for her work with Native North Americans, and she has written a prodigious number of books, Patterns of Culture, 1934, the one that is going to provide us with our essay here being one of those. She did develop an interesting psychological model of culture using Nietzsche's famous concept of Apollonian Dionysian. Now, we're going to see this one uh, later in um, World of Ideas on page 641, actually, in the Jacobus volume. She will describe different tribes as being either Apollonian or Dionysian. Just to finish Jacobus's treatment, uh, turn with me to page 512, and this is the way he will describe it. Benedict uses these psychological portraits drawn specifically from Nietzsche with the understanding of Apollonian Dionysian. With the understanding that they should not be applied absolutely. Apollonian, by the way, ordered, Dionysian, um, chaotic, and, and, and emotive, right? Um, with the understanding that they should not be applied absolutely, but with respect for variations. Her point, that is to say epistemologically the fallibilist position, right? Her point is that cultures develop much as individuals develop in response to the historical tradition. Quote, a culture, like an individual, is more or less consistent pattern of thought and action. Within each culture, there come into being characteristic purposes not necessarily shared by other types of society. End quote. Despite her use of the Nietzschean terms, Apollonian Dionysian, Benedict felt that there is no way to establish a typology of cultures. The terms were designed only to establish a useful characterization to help explain the ways of the culture. Benedict believed, along with Boaz and others, that one's own culture provides the lens through which one observes others. This is an important idea in anthropological study for the late 20th, early 21st century, obviously. Consequently, Benedict warns us our capacity to truly see and understand other peoples whose values and basic concepts are foreign is, in fact, limited. She also, to skip down a paragraph, she also has an emphasis on the vision quest associated with religion and religious rites. She reminds us that religion and ritual are central to the culture of the Native American, and she goes into great detail about both. Quote, she says, we cannot understand the Pueblo configuration of culture without a certain acquaintance with our customs, end quote. Uh, Benedict tells us a great deal about the distinctions between the Pueblo or the Zuni and their surrounding neighbors, emphasizing that although Zuni live extremely close to groups in Mexico and New Mexico, whose environments are essentially identical, the cultures are essentially distinct. Now, to, to this degree then, let's turn to um, Benedict's rhetoric and Jacobus' treatment of rhetoric on page 513. The use of comparison, put this in your notes, use of comparison central, and a clarity that is really remarkable. Some of you are going to point out this is one of the more powerful readings of the Jacobus volume. Let's just finish the last two paragraphs in Jacobus' treatment of Benedict's rhetoric. He says it this way. By beginning with the description of experiences common to our, to our own culture, such as courtship and marriage, Benedict concretizes her writing and pikes our interest immediately. However, Benedict soon moves on to describe events and concerns essentially exotic to our culture. We'll think about Herodotus already and his 
description of the Egyptians to the Greeks and the Greek readers, right? The connection, for example, between drugs and the religious quest for visions that will guide the individual and perhaps the group for a lifetime is quite unlike any experience we're likely to have. Our cultural use of drugs is either medicinal or recreational, usually not spiritual. For those of you who have been following Jordan Peterson's lectures on the, books of, on, the, on the book of Genesis, you know that several times he talks about this notion of having spiritual experiences, religious experiences, through the use of any number of narcotics. Finally, Benedict clarifies the issues behind the vision quest and those that separate the questers from Zuni. She focuses entirely on the careful and accurate description of Zuni customs, her ability to remain concrete, even in the face of her refusal to describe the individual experiences of members of Zuni, is remarkable, and I, I would agree with that. Let's go through now the some 32 uh, paragraphs of this reading quickly. Paragraphs 1 through 5. She says, the Zuni, or Pueblo, is a strongly socialized culture in which the individual is not important. Marriage and divorce are conducted very casually because the strongest bond in Zuni culture is that of the multi-lineal family. Whether or not they are married, women remain in the household into which they were born for life, and men return to their mother's home for all important occasions. Paragraph 6 through 7. While this blood relationship group, quote-unquote, is ceremonially the most important group in Zuni culture, it is not the functioning economical group. A man lives with his wife's family and provides for them unless there is no male labor in his mother's house. Thus, men have double allegiance to women, both his spouses and his brothers, with the latter usually holding more social weight. We think immediately of Plato's notions in uh, Republic Five, specifically about the whole di diminution of the, of the nuclear family argument, right? Paragraphs 8 through 10. Wealth has little importance in Zuni tribes. A family's value is determined by the sacred objects it owns, the ceremonial roles its members have undertaken. While ceremonial objects are personal property, they can be used by anyone qualified. Those who own those objects have, quote, no monopoly of their supernatural powers, and quote. Ceremonial participation is the responsibility of a group of people rather than the individual. Paragraphs 11 through 13, while the Zuni are a ritualistic people, so were most of the other American Indian cultures. What sets the Zuni apart from these cultures is their attitude toward existence. Borrowing Nietzsche's concepts of the Apollonian and the Dionysian personalities, that is to say, the organized versus the quasi-chaotic, the Pueblos are Apollonian, measured, reserved, intellectual, rational, while the other cultures are Dionysian, emotional and given to intoxication and excess as means to entering a different psychological state. By the way, one more time, we'll be looking at this Apollonian Dionysian essay of Nietzsche's later in another unit. Paragraphs um, um, 20, uh, 14, paragraph 14. Uh, the Pueblos see individualism and change as disruptive, even when it refines or enlarges the culture's tradition. They prefer to commit to the known rules and customs of their tradition. We think about comments that we've made before regarding, for example, the Chinese Confucian views. Very similar, right? Paragraphs 15 through 21. Other American Indian cultures as a whole were Dionysian, valuing violent experience and anything else that broke through the quote-unquote usual sensory routine. While these groups do not have a uniform culture, they do share a, quote, practice of obtaining supernatural power in a dream or vision, end quote, through some powerful exercise of concentration. These quests took place alone and often involved self-destructive acts such as torture or fasting, though the participants didn't see them as self-destructive because they were seeking not only a vision but also to become stronger or to succeed in a particular venture. Paragraphs 22 through 23. Since it was up to the individual to decide whether or not he had a vision, and since the individual was always alone, in theory, these experiences granted great freedom to the individual. But in practice, the traditions of these cultures remained largely unchallenged. In cultures where prestige was a great privilege, usually passed down through families, the vision quest was, was seen as disruptive. In these cases, the supernatural experience might be considered insignificant. Paragraphs 24 through 27. The supernatural experience itself, however, was openly pursued by entire tribes who used alcohol and drugs, at, such as peyote and gypsum weed, in ceremonies to, quote, obtain the blessed state which was to them supremely religious, end quote. 
to finish paragraphs 28 through 32, this practice of obtaining supernatural power from a vision prevails everywhere among the North American Indians except in the southern Pueblos who do not value excess and who perceive disruptive experiences as something to be avoided rather than pursued. For them, elements of the Dionysian experience exist, but they have been reinterpreted and transformed so that they fit the Pueblo's Apollonian character. Pueblo men, for example, go to feared and sacred places alone at night, but they are looking for omens, not visions. Fasting is required for ceremonial cleanliness rather than to create an altered psychological state. And gypsum weed is used to get someone to confess to a theft, after which it's purged from his body. Okay, so that's the reading. Let's work now quickly levels two and three. Well, in regards to our big five, epistemologically, what does this text suggest? I think it, it's clear. It's, um, we, we definitely have here, notice Benedict, arguing for the fallibilist position. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. She definitely is going to argue that the fallibilist position is a more profound position to take as an anthropologist than the absolutist position. I know and I'm absolutely certain, and anybody who argues against me is wrong. The use of the Apollonian Dionysian model by Nietzsche kind of quasi-proof of that. What does this text say about ontology? Well, clearly we do all long for answers because we're driven by curiosity. And ontologically, this text suggests there are those who are more Apollonian, that is to say more ordered, and then those who are more Dionysian, that is to say more maybe less rational and more, and more emotive. Psychologically, what does this text suggest? Well, no question, the power of fear has to be overcome, and the way that the power of fear or the desire to know the future or whatever is overcome can be handled differently, an Apollonian approach, a Dionysian approach. Sociologically, what does this text say? Well, clearly this makes the argument that we approach the world from multiplicity of different perspectives, an Apollonian or Dionysian being one of those possible uh, dualisms, but all of us are connected, obviously, in some way. What does this text say about theodicy and the existence of evil in the world? Well, this misunderstanding is a huge part of so much of the pain in the world, right? And, of course, misunderstanding culture leads to all kinds of cultural problems as well. Messages here at 2A, well, we grow by learning and obviously respecting other cultures. There has to be a balance between the Apollonian and the Dionysian. That is crucial. And then another possible message is that people go through a whole lot Right, of pain and suffering and any number of other experiences to learn and to try and understand and to adapt to environments. And to be powerful storytelling is the emphasis here, right? The use of the Nietzschean paradigm is as well useful. That, that relating one concept learned from the domain of philosophy in Nietzsche to anthropology. At 3A, well, we've mentioned the Nietzschean essay. We're going to um, relate it to um, any number of other ideas. Just play this game with me for a second. What would the Apollonian Dionysian model uh, say about Herodotus's view of the Egyptians? Would he see them as inherently mostly Apollonian or Dionysian? Interesting question. How about Devaka and his representation of culture? What would be the, uh, the view there? Would it be a primi primarily an Apollonian view or a Dionysian view? This is a good 3A. Now, notice, learning is connecting new information to old information, right, in meaningful ways. We can play the game that way. Finally, at 3B, to relate it to yourself, what are your thoughts about this notion of a vision quest or the desire to try and gain some kind of insight through a, an experience where you go through a certain kind of pain, where, for example, you go for several days and you don't eat or something like that, or obviously the use of some kind of hallucinogen or narcotic or whatever. Um, what are your thoughts about that kind of thing as a means whereby of having a, a religious experience? And then finally, we're going to pick up with this one in Lecture 43 when we do turn to Nietzsche's Apollonian Dionysian essay. Are you, are you more Apollonian or are you more Dionysian in your approach to your life, your studies, your uh, experiences in life. Well, the introduction to Benedict, brilliant, brilliant piece of writing. Well, uh, we'll hope that you've uh, been challenged a bit to think about yourself and the world. Thank you.